today is we'll be doing a falconry. So there's lots of interesting um, events that are coming up and then we take a break during the um, summer months and we'll be back again in August. Um, just while you guys are here, if you haven't been here before and you need to use the restroom, um, if you walk out the door, take a right, go down the hallway, and it is the first couple doors or openings on your left. Um, anything else that I'm forgetting? No? Okay. No, in case of a fire, follow one of us so we can get to know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so our presentation tonight, we can go ahead and get started because I know we've been waiting about 10 minutes already. Um, it is on sound manners, and our guest speaker is Dr. Kira McIntyre from Queens University, and I will let her tell a little bit about herself. Thank you. All right. So. Hello, everyone. Um, I am a biology professor at Queens University of Charlotte. I've been working there for a couple years now. I started in 2020, which is a very interesting time to start a new job. Um, but it's been a lot of fun and I like it a lot. I've been studying salamanders since I was in undergrad. So, I don't know, more than 10 years now. We'll just go with that. Um, so, I know a lot about them and I'm excited to share with you some of the local species and also just general knowledge. But let's start. What do you already know? What do you already know about salamanders? <laughs> yes, I have them in my yard. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. I do. All right. So let's go through some basics if it wants to proceed. Okay. So, what is a salamander? It's a type of amphibian. So, I heard you guys learned about frogs last month. Um, so, this is actually very similar to a frog, but they look a little bit more like lizards. They actually are a type of amphibian. The word amphibian means two lives, so they have part of their life in the water and part of their life on land, so aquatic and terrestrial. But one thing that's really interesting about salamanders is most of them are completely terrestrial, so they actually lost that metamorphosis stage of their life. Um, they actually metamorphose completely inside their egg and hatch as teeny tiny little adults, and this happens in the really humid, moist areas like in the mountains here in North Carolina. They have smooth skin, and they need water to survive. So if their skin dries out too much, they can't breathe, and they are not able to survive that. Over 70% of salamanders are lungless. So they don't breathe through lungs at all. They don't even have them. They breathe entirely through their skin, which is why that moisture is so important. If they lose the moisture on their skin, they actually can't breathe. There's no gas exchange happening across their skin, and they suffocate. There are currently 798-ish described species. That number changes a lot. Um, we'll talk about it at the end of this presentation, but they added, I think, seven new species at the end of last year, just here in North Carolina. So there's a lot, that's an influx a lot. There's constantly new species being described. And that's happening for a few different reasons, but we'll talk about that later. So where do salamanders live? Um, mostly they live in areas that have water, not surprisingly. So things like wetlands, <coughs> ponds, streams, seeps, which are like really small streams coming out of um, springs and things like that. They also live in caves and you find them a lot in forested areas. Um, here in North Carolina, they're found across the entire state, so everywhere from the coastal plain all the way up into the mountains. But they are found worldwide, and we'll look at the distribution of them in a little bit. They generally are nocturnal, so they're mostly active at night, um, and they also are found under rocks and logs. So if you haven't seen a salamander yet, that's probably why. If you aren't tromping around the woods at night with a headlamp on, there's a good chance you haven't seen one. You're not digging under rocks and logs. Again, good chance you haven't seen one. A lot of people don't even know that they're here um, in this specific area of North Carolina because you just don't see them if you're not looking for them. Some of them migrate to and from the water every year. Um, other ones move less. So some of the species that are completely terrestrial actually move less than a square meter for their entire lives. They just hang out in one spot, and they just move up and down in the soil layers, and they don't really move very far. 
So there are some species, the ones that still breed in water, that will move back and forth to what's called upland habitat and to those streams. Um, but then some of them don't. So that's kind of neat. And they're highly abundant. So there's actually a lot of them. But again, you don't necessarily see them unless you're looking for them. Just to kind of point out, because this is a cool picture. Um, so salamanders are known to regenerate their limbs. And this one is in the process of regenerating its foot. You can kind of see it has teeny tiny little fingers. It's like starting to regrow them. So I just like that sort of thing. It's just adorable. So what do salamanders do? Why do we care about them? Why are they important? <coughs> a big thing they do is eat bugs. So this is really helpful for a bunch of different reasons. They can get rid of pests and regulate different environmental processes. Um, this is a picture of one eating a moth, which is unusual. They don't usually eat flying insects, but this one got lucky. It actually was tripping over it because it was too big to fit in its mouth. It was very cute. Um, they're also really important for moving nutrients around. So because they have this biophasic life cycle where they spend part of their life in water and part of it on land, whatever they're eating in the water, they move it to the land once they get out of the water, then whatever eats them eats it on land and they're moving nutrients from one spot to another. Also, when they deposit their eggs in the water, any of them that don't survive or get eaten by the aquatic things, then they're moving nutrients from the land into the water. So they're really, really important for that process of just this movement of nutrients from one place to another. They're surprisingly long-lived. So a lot of salamander species have a lifespan that we're guessing is about 10 years. But some of them can live up to 30 or even more, depending on where they are and if they, of course, don't get eaten or dry out or any of these other challenges that come with living. Um, but it's really impressive that they can live this such a long amount of time and it allows them to survive in areas where you may not expect them to because if they try to reproduce one year and it's a bad year because, I don't know, there's a polar vortex that comes through and kills everything or there's a drought and it gets too dry, they usually are okay because they can try to reproduce next year and if it's a good year then you have a lot more that make it to adulthood and then you get this survival going on. So that's one of the things that makes them really unique and makes them really, really important to the environment. So because of the combination of things, of them being carnivores that eat insects and being really long lived, they actually regulate carbon cycles. So people talk about carbon a lot in the context of climate change because carbon dioxide levels are rising. This is causing a lot of problems. They actually are really helpful in keeping that down a little bit. So if you, because they're eating insects, a lot of the insects eat leaf litter and break it down and make it decompose faster. If you have salamanders in the area, they'll eat the insects, which reduces the amount of leaf litter that's decomposed. Decomposition is a process that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So if you reduce the rate of decomposition, you actually are keeping carbon out of the atmosphere. Also, because they live such a long time, whatever carbon is in their bodies, they just hold on to it. <laughs> like, this is mine now. And until they actually die, they're not going to be recycling it into the environment as well. So they actually did a study several years ago that showed in areas where you don't have salamanders, you exclude them. You make a little plot and keep them out of there. It causes this big change in the amount of carbon. And because they're so abundant, it actually has a really big impact. Even if you think about one salamander this big, not having that much impact, but you have 10,000 of them, then it starts to make a big difference. There's also some medical interests for doing research with salamanders. One of the big ones that we already mentioned was regeneration of limbs. So they can actually regenerate entire limbs. Some of them, can, some species can even regenerate eyes and things like that. So we are studying them like crazy, trying to figure out how they do it. What are the processes here? And can we potentially figure out those cellular me mechanisms and do it ourselves? Um, it's really quite remarkable how quickly they can do this. When I was studying salamanders in Texas, in early December, these are in spring-dwelling salamanders, so the water stays about 70 degrees Fahrenheit year-round. I saw one that didn't have a hand, it had a little stump. 
by the end of January, he had all five figures. It was so fast. Um, we had these individuals marked, so I know it was the same animal. It was so neat to see. It happened so, so fast. Um, they also are known for doing research with them because some of them have antifungal bacteria on their skin. So a lot of salamanders have parental care where they will actually hang out with the eggs before they hatch. And one of the main reasons they do this is it keeps them from getting a fungal infection. So if you remove the females or if they abandon the nest, it almost always dies from fungus. But if the females stay there, they move in and out of the eggs, and it turns out they have bacteria on their skin that produce chemicals that kill fungus. And so they actually are able to protect their eggs by doing this. And so a lot of research is trying to understand, you know, what are those different molecules that are being created and how could we potentially use those to combat fungal infections ourselves. So where are salamanders found and how many are there? Um, they're found all over the world. Um, this map is from a program called iNaturalist. Have you guys heard of iNaturalist before? Yes. So iNaturalist is a citizen science program where you, anyone in the world can submit photos of things that they find. And this is the map of where people have found salamanders. So this is not um, completely encompassing where all the salamanders are in the world. There's a few more in the middle of the Amazon over there, but of course there's not very many people there, so they're not recording them as much. So it's not an accurate description completely, but you get a general idea of where things are found. One of the other things I do want to point out that is also accurate is in the southeastern United States, you can see that, that that color gets a lot darker, and that's accurate. We actually have the highest density of diversity of salamanders in the world. So we just have a crazy crap ton of salamanders here in North Carolina, and it's awesome. Um, so one study actually found that there were more biomass. So biomass is just if you put all of them into a container and weigh them. How much would it weigh? There was more of that salamander stuff than birds and mammals combined. So they're tiny, but numerous, <laughs> but very, very numerous. And so they do make a really big difference in that sense. So here's a map from iNaturalist for North Carolina. Um, you can see there's a lot of them really centered in the mountains. That's where we get a lot of different species. And so you're gonna get a lot of different numbers there, but also it's nice and cool and nice and wet. So it's a really good place to be a salamander. You do get some along the coastal plain as well, but a lot of those are harder to find because many of them are completely aquatic. And so again, if you're not looking for them, you're much less likely to encounter them. Whereas up in the mountains, even around here sometimes, you might see them crossing streets, and so they're more likely to see them. Also, you'll notice there's a cluster right here, and that's because there's a city there. So again, there's more people, more people sending out records. Um, the area with the most different species is actually Central America, but because each species, many of the species are what's called a mountaintop endemic, meaning they're only found on a single mountain. We go to the next mountain and it's a different species because they are separated for a long enough period of time, they don't get exchanged anymore between individuals. So they're each unique species. We're finding that's true more and more here as well um, with all the diversity, but because they're not overlapping in their distribution, because it's such a small distribution, you don't get this same sort of density that you do here. So here in North Carolina, we have anywhere from, depending on what you look at, 64 to 72 species in North Carolina. At my study site for my doctorate, which was right over here, um, it was a five kilometer by five kilometer area and there were 13 species. 13 different kinds of salamanders. It was awesome. <laughs> so they are a species of conservation concern. We are interested in preserving salamanders for a few different reasons. Um, and yes, when they metamorphose, they can be very tiny. <laughs> One of the reasons is there is something called a canary in a coal mine. So they're considered the canary in the coal mine of the environment. Do you guys know what the canary in the coal mine phrase refers to? So a couple of head shakes, so we'll, say, we'll explain it. 
The idea was whenever coal miners would go down into the mines, they would bring a canary with them because canaries were more sensitive to carbon monoxide than humans were. So if the canary died, you're like, hey, carbon monoxide levels are getting bad. We best get out of here. Salamanders and amphibians in general are considered the canary in the coal mine of the environment. So if they start dying, maybe we should be concerned. <laughs> They're a little more sensitive than we are to things like toxins, slight changes in the environment. So it's of concern when they start declining. They're vulnerable to a few different things. Climate change, of course, being one of them. If you start changing weather patterns, it's going to change the rainfall. Change the rainfall, they die. Remember? Moisture. It's all about water for these guys. Um, temperature influences that a little bit as well. If you get to higher temperature, you dehydrate faster, but it's, that's less of an issue because they're nocturnal, so they can kind of avoid some of those temperature changes using behavior. But if they lose too much water, then it's a major issue. So really changing rainfall patterns are the biggest threat to these guys. One of the things that's a major concern as well is we have some species that are mountaintop endemics, meaning they only live on the mountaintops. And one thing that's happening is, or people are worried about, is essentially they're going to get pushed off the top of the mountain. So if right now the top of the mountain is great habitat, this is the ideal temperature, ideal amount of rainfall, everything is going well for these guys. And it's a little bit drier, a little bit warmer, lower down the mountain. So as climates change, what we're expecting to see is essentially a shift in those weather patterns up the mountain. So the top of the mountain will be more like what the lower part of the mountain is right now. So these species are going to be fine. They can just move up, theoretically, if they will move more than their meter <laughs> square that they usually move. Theoretically, they can move up, but these guys have nowhere to go. And so the idea of being pushed off the mountain top is something that people are talking a lot about with these guys. But also just having more competition. So if the ones that are used to the warmer temperatures start moving up the mountain, they're going to start competing with the ones that are used to the polar temperatures. So that's another big concern as well. Probably the biggest issue for salamanders is actually just land use change and habitat loss. So you get rid of the streams, you fill in the wetlands, they have nowhere to live. You can see why that would be problematic. <laughs> um, so that's probably one of the biggest issues in the mountains. One of the things is with people building houses up in the tops of the mountains, they have to build roads to get to the houses. The roads change the way the water flows, so that can actually change the streams, which can then change the populations of the salamanders. So there's a lot of sort of cascading effects that you don't always think of right away that can actually have a much bigger impact on the overall system. And then disease is another big issue. So there is a fungal disease, I don't know if you heard about it last month, um, killing a bunch of frogs. <laughs> it's called BD. Well, there's another one. Most salamanders are okay with BD. It's a fungal disease. A lot of them have antifungal bacteria. They seem to be able to survive the BD infection. Most of them. There's a new disease that's actually killing the salamanders as well. So it's called B cell or Botrachychytrium salamanderiensis. You understand why we shortened it to B cell? Um, it actually started really increasing in numbers in, I think it was Sweden and Norway. Um, there's a few species of salamander up there called fire salamanders, and they started getting these lesions all over them that were caused by this fungal disease. It was thought that it was, it's happening more because of changing temperatures. So before it got cold enough in Norway and Sweden that it killed off the virus, but now it's not getting quite as cold, and so it's able to survive more and spread. Their species in the United States are potentially susceptible to this. We're still not really sure how susceptible they are. Um, but the United States actually put in a policy to prevent the spread of this disease when it arrives, which is kind of impressive. So it's actually illegal to move plethodon salamanders across state lines because you're trying to prevent the spread of this disease because it's kind of inevitable it's going to get here eventually. So yeah, in case you didn't know, don't move salamanders across state lines. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> ah, there we go. All right, so um, we're going to spend most of our time kind of focusing on what kind of salamanders you can find here in Union County. 
But I wanted to start with what have you guys seen? Oh, pick me. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, have, I have one. And now that I know that most of them only traveled within a meter, it's probably the same settlement that I keep seeing. <laughs> it's in the, the same spot all the time. It's underneath one of my ceramic planters. Uh -huh. And whenever I move it to clean out all the leaves, I see him, so I put the leaves back and move it. But he's always there. It's been like three years now in a row. But it's black with white spots. Yeah, it's probably the same one. And it's probably about six inches. Yeah. I think they're pretty good. Yeah, that's a slimy salamander. He's very cool. They're very cool. I thought it was a ninja. Because isn't there a one called a ninja? I was like, yes, I got ninja salamanders, <laughs> but I guess I don't. I don't know that. <laughs> I believe it though, they're very sneaky. I have personally watched some winners. So I studied aquatic ones when I was an undergraduate, and we were trying to catch them with dip nets. And I swear, I have been staring at a salamander. It wiggles and it just vanishes. You're like, where did you go? I was watching you. Black To this day, I may take it. It's black magic. <laughs> Has anyone else seen a salamander before? Yeah, we see a uh, marble, I, I think, what are marble salamanders mm -hmm. around our house like all the time. We, we live in like a pretty wooded neighborhood and there's like a creek right behind their house. And I, I see them like in, in the driveway sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but usually, you know, only when it's wet. Right. But they're cool. Yeah, they're usually pretty big and, you know, they have like gray and white kind of pattern. Um, yeah. yeah. They don't actually get that big. They're chunky though. They're pretty chunky. Yeah. They're very stout. And this one is a very stout. Anyone else seen this on there? Maybe I have a picture of one. <laughs> I don't want to say you know, so, yeah, it's it's very cool. Cool. I'm like, it's always the same one. So you can actually look at the spot card of it and you can tell us what the water on. <laughs> you take pictures multiple times, you can compare the spot patterns and like confirm that it's the same. Yeah, that it's the same individual. Yeah. I do that with marbles. <laughs> Um, so here's a list of all of the ones that I could find that have records here in Union County. Um, here's the map from my naturalist where they picked out, it only has six species, but there are several others that occur here as well or have the potential to occur here. Oh, wait. I, I was thinking at my house I don't see them. I work here at the Hag Center. Yeah. You go to the, if anybody does want to see one, go to the archery. Uh -huh. um, because we do macro and bird, bird studies and we find salamanders all the time. Do you know what they look like? Uh -huh. Do you remember? They're always so small and they all look different. So uh, it's hard to say. I'll have to come out sometime and we can do a survey and try to figure out what they are. I have them. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, my <laughs> um, so I know these are the ones you have, so we're going to look at some pictures of like what they are and how you can tell which one is which. What's the difference between a salamander and a newt? I will get to that when we get to the newt, I promise. That is a great question. All right, so marble salamanders are one of the ones that I study, and they're very distinctive because they have this black and white or black and gray marbling pattern on their backs. You can actually use this pattern to tell individuals apart, um, so you can actually see if it's the same one that you're seeing over and over again. And I have some different life phases of them because I study them, so I have lots of pictures. So whenever they're larvae, they have these big bushy gills, and they use that to get oxygen out of the water. The gills actually change shape depending on how oxygenated the water is. So if you have a lot of oxygen in the water, they get smaller because they can get enough oxygen without it. If you blow oxygen, like these guys, then you have really big bushy gills because they're trying to get as much oxygen as possible from the water. When they metamorphose, they look black and they don't have a lot of patterning on them. a few weeks old. Um, they actually start getting this sort of like pattern on them and then it becomes this really distinctive banding. One of the things that I'm currently trying to figure out is how early we can start telling which individual is which um, or do we have to wait until they get their, their final pattern. Um, this one also is kind of hard to tell in here because there's lots of lights but this one also has eggs so these little little balls underneath it is actually a nest so they're sitting on their eggs. One of the really cool things about marbled salamanders is they are the only one of their genus. So they're, and ah, nice. Um, their species name is Ambystema opacum, and they're the only Ambystema that has parental care. 
So they lay their eggs in ephemeral wetlands, meaning a temporary wetland, so it's only full of water per the year. They lay their eggs before the water arrives. So in about late October around here, they lay their eggs and then they sit on them and they wait for the water to come. And then as soon as the wetland fills, the eggs can hatch and they leave and they move on with their lives. But they're the only ones that do that. The reason that they lay their eggs in the winter is because these guys overlap a lot of their range with spotted salamanders, which we'll look at next. Spotted salamanders are bigger and they breed in the spring. So if these guys breed in the winter, their larvae can get bigger than the other ones before they arrive. So instead of getting eaten by all the spotted salamander larvae, now they get to be the ones eating the spotted salamander larvae. They will eat pretty much anything that moves and can fit in their mouth. So that's how they, how they work. So it's a really cool system. Um, and the spotted salamanders are also really neat. They're very distinctive. They have yellow spots. Um, it's really hard to mistake this for anything else. Um, the spotted salamanders have another really cool, unique adaptation, and that is they actually have, some of them have algae in their cells. So the algae that's associated with these, the reason these are bright green, is called Oophila and this something. Um, and so they actually can turn, they turn green and they actually get some energy from the Oophila. Um, through photosynthesis, and they actually get oxygen from them and they grow better whenever they have this algae associated with them. What's really cool about it is they recently found out that the algae is not just in the egg casing around the eggs and it doesn't come from the pond. It actually comes from the salamander itself. So the mothers pass on the algae to their offspring, which is wild. So they actually live in their cells their entire lives. It's bananas. <laughs> They're solar salamanders. That's the only known association where you have this internal plant inside a vertebrae. So this is very similar to what we see in corals. So corals have algae inside their cells as well, but they're in invertebrates. It's a very different situation. It's super cool. <laughs> These guys are a little bit bigger. They have really massive migrations in the spring when it first rains. Um, there's actually places in the Northeast where they will close roads for a little while and just try to help carry them across because otherwise they get hit by cars a lot. And a massive migration of salamanders like that is called a maelstrom. So is the algae actually inside of them or is it on the outside? It's in the cells. So it's in the cells. Yeah. Like inside of the cells. Yep. Yeah, we don't quite know where it goes when it's inside the adult salamanders. We don't really understand that whole situation yet, but they did find the algae DNA in the ovidex, which means that they are passing it on to their offspring in some way, but we don't really know where it goes. <laughs> it's a mystery. But whenever it's in the eggs, egg casings, it's mostly around the outside edges. So another one that's less common in this area, but the range does overlap here, so there's potential to see it, is something called a mole salamander. So this is very similar to those other two species, nice and chunky. Um, it's one easy way to tell if it's an embistema or not. It has that really stocky shape. These guys do have lungs, all three of them, and they do have this biphasic life where they lay their eggs in water and then merge on land. One cool thing about mole salamanders is they actually can stay in the water their entire lives. So some populations, if they live in permanent water, so in things like ponds, they can actually do something called pateomorphosis. So this is a lot like an axolotl, where they will stay in that juvenile form and they can have their gills and then they can still breed. These guys you can tell uh, apart because their larvae have stripes going down their, their body so you can tell apart the different larvae type. Another common one in streams and seeps and just sort of muddy wet areas is something called the Northern Dusky Salamander, Desmonathus fuscus. A feature, way you can tell what they are, um, is they all, Desmonathus, have this white line 
on their chin, going from their eye down the side of their face. So that's one way you can tell it's a desmenathus. These guys are lungless, so they're pretty small and slender, and they do require staying nice and wet to survive. Most of the ones around here are pretty dark in color like this one. If you go to different areas, you get a lot of color variation. They can be a lot lighter brown, they can have orange on them, they can have sort of spotting patterns down their backs. You get a lot of variety depending on where you are. And we'll look at some examples of a similar species in a little bit. Two line salamanders have two lines down their bodies. So that one's pretty easy to remember. Um, here we have the southern two line salamander, which is Eurecia cerigera. It looks almost identical to Eurecia bislineata, which is the northern two line salamander, and to the Blue Ridge two line, two -line salamander, um, Eurecia wildrae. That one is actually Eurecia wildrae, but I wanted to show you um, because the males develop these structures on their face during the breeding season called Siri. So lungless salamanders have something called nasolabial grooves. So they have a little groove going from their nose to their mouth. And what they can do with that is they can tap their mouth on the ground and pick up scents and it'll go through capillary action up to their nose. So they can actually pull scents from the ground. So during the breeding season, the males get those little Siri so that they can more easily pick up scents and find the females. Plus they look like they have little mustaches and it's adorable. <laughs> but yeah, these guys are pretty distinctive. They're long and slender, usually kind of yellow or gold in color. And they have those two really distinctive black stripes. They mostly breed in streams and they're fairly tolerant to disturbance. So you actually will find these guys in relatively urban streams. I found one in Freedom Park up in Charlotte. Just hanging out. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, they're really cool. They're really pretty. As larvae, they're not as colorful. They're usually just brown, small, slender, kind of bushy gills. Again, the size of the gills depends on um, how much water they have, but their gills will be kind of red in color. The Desmonathus gills are white because they actually don't have blood flow going through their gills. A very similar species is the three-line salamander, Eurecia glutolineata. So this one has three stripes instead of two. It's very easy to tell them apart when they're adults. The three-line salamander is also a little bit bigger than the two-line salamander. Um, yeah, I don't really have any fun facts about that one. The one that you saw, um, the white spotted slimy salamander is Plethron cylindratus. Um, so here is a juvenile and an adult. So they can range in size quite a bit. I found both of these in Charlotte, so these are found nearby. Cool things about slimy salamanders is there's a whole bunch of different species that look identical. So the only way you know what you have is you have to know where you are. <laughs> it's all about geography. Uh, as a defense mechanism, they produce slime. It's very, very sticky. It is a really good super glue. You have to peel it off of your skin or scrape it off. It does not come off with open water. <laughs> know this from experience. Um, I also love telling the story about my PhD advisor, whenever he was doing research and they had Petri dishes, they were labeling with tape. If they ran out of tape, they would just rub the label on the back of the salamander and stick it on there. And apparently the lab assistants hated it because you have to like scrape it off to get it off again. But yeah. Um, the reason that they produce slime is it's a really great defense mechanism because if a snake or something tries to bite them, they'll produce a lot of slime on their tails and they'll wipe their tail all over its face. So then leaves and things all get stuck to its face and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> and so it has to drop it. So it does okay. So a uh, Less common one, but can be found in this area, is something called a four-toed salamander. So most salamanders have four toes on their front feet and five on their back. These guys only have four and four. And they're found in really mossy areas. So they mostly breed in really dense sphagnum moss mats. That's mostly where you find them. They also breed in really early spring. They do have parental care, so they will stay with their eggs. 
They also have communal breeding where they will lay eggs in groups and then one of them will take care of all the eggs for a little while and then they'll move on. They do have a larval phase, so they will drop into the water, but it's only about three to six weeks long. So they're not in the water for very long before they move on out. I really wanna see one of these. This is like one of my top species that I haven't seen yet, and I really wanna find them. But you really have to search through moss mats and it's just very difficult to find them. They have really distinctive white and uh, black spotted undersides. And that's one of the ways that you can tell what they are. Really vibrant ones that can be found around here. Again, it's not gonna be very common, but they do live here are mud and red salamanders. I have these on the same page because they're almost identical. So they're the same genus, Pseudotriton montanus and Pseudotriton ruber. As you can see, they're both bright orangey red with black spots. Um, the main ways that you can tell them apart is the montanus, the mud salamander, has a slightly more rounded nose that it has brown eyes. And the red salamander has a slightly more pointed nose and its eyes are kind of gold. It's a tough one. <laughs> They're really difficult. Um, they can, both species can be a little bit more dull. They aren't necessarily always this really bright red. But one of the reasons that they are bright red is they actually do produce toxins. So they produce something that's called pseudotriton toxin and it's noxious. So it won't kill you, but it tastes bad. So I always recommend do not go licking salamanders. It's a bad idea. It's an even worse idea with the next ones. Eastern red spotted newts are very cool, but they produce tetrodotoxins. So those can kill you. So don't lick salamanders, bad idea. So what is the difference between a newt and a salamander? Salamanders, uh, newts are a type of salamander. So newts have a triphasic life cycle where they actually start out, they hatch in water, they move on to land and have this teenage F phase where they're bright orange it looks like someone dropped a toy in the middle of the forest. This is when they're really toxic. So they're just like, whatever, I don't care. And they'll walk around during the daytime. They're fantastic. And then they will return to the water as an adult. They get more dull. They have a more flattened tail so they can live in the water and then they stay in the water as adults. So that's the main difference between, between the two. But they're very charming. So I do have some other pictures of other species from North Carolina. Um, as I mentioned before, from the coastal plains to the mountain, there's anywhere from 64 to 72 species, depending on what source you look at. But we have a lot. <laughs> we have a lot of species in North Carolina. I don't have pictures of all of them, but I have a few that I've taken just to kind of show you some of the stuff that I've seen. But first, we'll look at two lists. So in the coastal plain, you get some more aquatic species, things like the greater siren. So sirens are permanently aquatic species. They have big fluffy gills. They have really unique mouth shapes. Again, unless you're looking for these, you're probably not gonna see them. They mostly live in muddy water. Um, if you're going out and trapping for minnows or something, you might catch one, but generally speaking, you're not gonna see them very often. We also get water dogs in the coastal plain. So those also are permanently aquatic. They have bushy gills and they're really cool. Um, you have more dusky salamanders as well. And then the dwarf salamander, which looks a lot like a two-lined salamander, but it only has four toes on its back feet. They tolerate salt water? Some of them can tolerate a little bit, but not very much because salts tend to dehydrate. And so they can't tolerate it very well. There's a few species of amphibians that are adapted to more brackish water, so they can deal with it and they figure it out ways, but most species can't tolerate salt water. In the mountains, we have a very long list of species. Um, and we're gonna look at some pictures of a few of them, but there's a lot in the mountains. This is why it's the diversity capital of the world. So here's some of the things that I've seen. Um, this is a red salamander, but in the mountains, a lot of them have this really distinctive black chin, and it looks like it got into some chocolate cake with sprinkles, and so I love it. <laughs> it's fantastic. 
Um, over on the top corner there is actually three different sizes of a hellbender. Hellbenders are also called snot otters, which is just a fantastic name. And they can get quite large. They can get to be about a foot. So there you have a really young larva, probably about a yearling, and then one that's probably at least five or six years old. These guys can get really big and they can get really old. They live under really big rocks in fast flowing rivers, um, which is why they have this flattened shape so they can hold on to the bottom and not get washed away by the water. It also helps them get oxygen because they have ruffles down in their skin, kind of like a Sharpay where it has all these extra folds of skin. So it lets the water flow over it and then get more oxygen from the water. Here are some other really pretty bright red ones that are called spring salamanders, Gyronophilus porphyriticus. They're distinguished from the red ones though because they have a more squared off face and they have these yellow stripes down their nose. These are all in the genus Plethodon. So we have a southern redback salamander that I found at the um, Great Smoky Mountains. Um, not surprisingly, it has a red back. And you'd think that would be an easy characteristic, but there's a bunch that mimic it and that makes it more difficult. But Plethodons all have this very distinctive round head shape. It's very oval. Um, and that's different than a lot of other species, which might be more triangular. Um, and that's one of the ways that you can tell them apart. You have the red-legged salamander and another white-spotted slimy type thing. Um, I believe this one is the Southern Appalachian salamander. One of my absolute favorites are the Plethodon teahollies. So this is a teaholly salamander. They have this gorgeous chestnut back and white spotting down their sides. They're closely related to the slimies. They also produce a lot of slime. They're really, really pretty. You can find them over in the Black Mountain area. Some more fun ones in the Plethodon area, except for that mimic. Um, you have the red cheek salamanders, which are found only in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And they have red cheeks. We're very creative in our naming of these, as you can see. One thing that's really cool about Plethodons is during the breeding season, the males produce this big swollen patch on their chin that's called a mental gland. And they literally like slap their chin against the females to deliver pheromones to like get them in the mood to mate with them. It's just really funny to watch. One other cool thing about salamanders that you may not know is at night when it's nice and humid out, a lot of them will climb on plants and anything that's on the ground. So here's a picture of a couple of them doing that where they climbed up on a branch and now it's just hanging out. This is what I did a lot of my dissertation work on trying to understand what the heck they're doing <laughs> because if their activity depends on water loss you would think that getting off the ground would increase airflow and would increase water loss but it turns out that it seems like they mostly climb when the air is actually cooler than the ground is so when a cold front moves in in the fall is a good example of that so the soil has warmed up over the summer and then a cool front moves in so the air gets nice and cold and then if they climb, it actually lowers their body temperature and lowers their dehydration rate so they can stay out longer. So that was, that's my dissertation in a nutshell. <laughs> Using physics to predict behavior, super cool. Um, this one actually is a Desmonathus. So you can tell it's an Echoe type because it has the more triangular shape, but it also has the red legs, like we saw with this one, the Plethodon. So we think that they're mimicking them because the plethodons are slimier than these guys are. They're much stickier. And so we think that they're mimicking them to try and be like, oh yeah, I'm totally red-legged. You don't want to eat me. They're not, but you know, they're trying. The Echoes have a lot of variety. They've actually been split into a couple of different species now, but their color variation is still quite phenomenal. So these and that red-legged one we just looked at are all the same species as far as we know. Um, and you can see there's a lot of variation. Some of them have those bright orange cheeks, probably mimicking those red cheeked ones we looked at earlier. Some of them just have these gorgeous patterns on them. I don't know why. <laughs> this is a mystery for the ages right now. There are black belly salamanders that are much larger. They tend to be associated with water and they have black bellies. 
Um, they were recently split into four different species, but also they just look very derpy. So they're fun. Um, and this is a sealed salamander, which can get as big as these guys if these guys are not there. If these guys are there, they bully them and keep them smaller. Couple more species in the Desmonathus group as well. So you can see they still have that light cheek stripe. Um, this is a dwarf, or sorry, a pygmy salamander and a seepage salamander. So you can find the seepage salamanders staying with their nests sometimes. So these are the eggs. You can kind of see the embryos. You can see the little head of the salamander there. Um, you can find those under moth mat moss mats and seepage areas but they are direct developing. So they don't have a larval stage. Um, these guys all do have a larval stage, though sometimes it's really short. The plethodons don't have a larval stage either. They're direct developers. But these are really small, and then the pygmies are even smaller, and they have this sort of chevron pattern down their back. And if you flip them over, you can actually see all of their insides and their hearts are kind of bold. I don't know why, but it's really neat. <laughs> So as I've mentioned a couple of times, we are constantly discovering new species. Um, the black belly salamander, that name was actually entirely taken away recently in 2022, and it was split into four new species. And so those are the current distributions of that. Um, the Akoe salamander is also recently split into three species, but they kept the name Akoe salamander as well. And all of this is happening because of something called cryptic diversity which means we can't see it, but there's genetic distinctions between these different groups. So with the black bellied salamanders, the areas that are in different colors there are actually groups where you get enough genetic exchange that they're considered one group, but between the groups, you don't get a lot of a genetic exchange. So there's some sort of barrier between those groups. We don't know what it is. It could be a river, it could be a different mountain range. This is all in the mountains, so probably not entirely that. It could also be a behavioral difference of so they just aren't breeding together anymore for some reason, but we know that they are genetically distinct groups, and so they have been determined to be different species. So one of the big reasons that we're finding new species all the time is because they look identical. <laughs> and so you can't really tell just based off of the way they look um, but we're learning more and more about how to understand what's going on in the background, and that's helping us figure that out. The reason it's important is when you're trying to understand conservation, if all of this was one species, then it may not be as much of a conservation concern, whereas if you're looking at four different species, well, now you're trying to conserve four different places. So you have to split your conservation decisions a little bit differently. And you know, there's different questions about whether or not it's worth it, which we're not gonna get into right now, <laughs> but that's kind of why it's important that we keep finding all of this cryptic diversity. So I'll spend a couple of minutes just kind of briefly talking about some of the research that I do. So I am currently monitoring a population of marbled salamanders and looking for some other ones to try and understand this breeding behavior a little bit better and understand this parental care. So how this all started was I was introduced to this study area in 2020 when I moved here and we found a bunch of nests and it was like, oh neat, that's really cool. We went out two weeks later and they were all gone, all of them. So some of them got flooded and probably hatched and then a bunch of them seemed to have gotten abandoned and possibly eaten. And so I started exploring this question of how much does disturbance affect their nesting behavior? So it turns out they abandoned their nests at about a 25% rate, which is pretty high considering most abandoned nests don't hatch. Um, and so I'm trying to understand how that might affect the overall population and how disturbing them, whether it's you know deer or pigs digging through the leaf litter or researchers uncovering them, how much that affects their decision to abandon their nest. So that's one of the things. It's been really difficult because last year was a drought. <laughs> This past year, it's also been pretty dry. And then there was the polar vortex. So, you know, that was fun. Another thing I'm doing is looking at color variation of gray tree frogs. So gray tree frogs look kind of like this. They blend into the background of um, tree bark really, really well. But they're known to vary in color from green to gray to brown. 
and there's no research as to like what's going on there, <laughs> like when there are certain colors, if there's a geographic pattern to it. But one of the things that I noticed is that a lot of them, whenever they first metamorphose, are bright green. And so I've been trying to figure out when they're really young, when do they decide to turn brown and why? I have no idea because everything we've tried so far doesn't seem to make a difference. They do whatever they want. More research to be done. <laughs> um, so I'm still working on that. And then also just starting to look at the adult distribution of color variation and sort of what's going on there. It has never been studied for this species. It has been studied for a similar species, the Eastern gray tree frog in 1912 and in 1954. And that's it. <laughs> so still a lot we don't know about what's going on with this color variation or if it matters and, and why it exists. So I'm currently exploring that. Are those pretty common around here? They're very common around here. I, see, I think I see them all the time. Mm -hmm. Usually yeah. they're pretty green, but at least that's like in the wooded areas. There's also green tree frogs. So yeah. yes, know. please show me pictures. <laughs> um, if they're sort of modeled in color, then they're probably gray tree frogs. But if they're solid green, they're probably green tree frogs. I, I see the the ones I see recently are kind of marbled like this. So cool. Definitely want to see pictures because I want to understand what's happening here. <laughs> you know, you would think so. The juveniles don't seem to. <laughs> we tried that first. Yeah, that was the first thing we tried was giving them different color backgrounds. And most of them seemed to respond to that. The brown ones would turn more brown, whatever they were in. And but then the green one, the ones in the green containers were like, nah, I'm going to turn brown. Then there were a few of them in the brown containers that were like, I'm staying green. I don't know what you want from me. Okay. So yeah, because that's what I would think too. Right. Right. Nice. Yeah, definitely a good job. Yeah. So yes, it's a mystery because you would think, yes. And when they get older, they do seem to background match. As soon as they're at least, I don't know, a few months old, then they will kind of change tone of like darker to lighter to match like tree bark and stuff. Um, this is just from observations. We haven't started doing research on that yet. But when they're young, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. I think it's temperature related, but our incubator broke last year. So I don't know yet <laughs> to be determined. Um, one other thing that I think is probably going to come out of this is the green ones are probably more active, so they actually have different behavioral strategies, because once they're gray, they can blend in, um, but when they're green, they're much more noticeable, and so I think they're going to change their behavioral strategy depending on that, but to be determined, I will let you know what I find. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see what happens, but it's really fascinating. Um, it's actually kind of a fun story of how this started. In 2021, I had a student who was looking at how water lilies impact water temperature. So whether if they're covering the whole surface of the pond, if that changes the water temperature, it doesn't really seem to. But we were exploring that. And about two weeks before her project ended, we suddenly had thousands of frog eggs. <laughs> so we had these like Rubbermaid tubs of water that were now full of tadpoles. Um, so I kept them for a little bit longer, and I didn't know what they were at the time. I suspected tree frogs based on the way the eggs were laid, but I wasn't sure if they were green or gray. When they emerged, some were brown and some were green. So I was like, cool, I have a little of each. And then I put the green ones in some moss, and they turned brown in hours. <clears throat> well, all right then. <laughs> so new project <laughs> got started there. But yeah, that visual cue that I thought of them matching, they don't seem to care. So I don't know how they make that decision. Still trying to figure it out. Science, it's full of questions. So I have a silly comic and you guys can ask me questions. <laughs> yes, I will, I will look at that too, but yeah. What's your question? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, okay, so if, if in, individuals stay within a, a meter or three meters, how many individuals are actually in that space? And how do they find a mate if they don't go anywhere? Yeah, that is a really good question. 
enough of them are in that square meter. So there's enough underground networks going on that we can't see. It's possible they're moving further distances underground, but what studies have found of looking at their surface activity is you find the same individuals over and over again, usually within about a square meter of where you first saw them. Um, so it's just that those square meters overlap enough that you have enough, yeah, enough to find a mate. For some species, like the redbacks, there's been a lot more studies done on northern redbacks, eastern redbacks, and they find that like the males might have a slightly larger territory and then they'll have females sort of set around them so that there's overlap between them. They will defend their territories of whichever places have good food. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting, this is like kind of gross too, but um, the females will actually like mash their faces into poop of other salamanders and kind of smell it and just be like, is this a good area where they're finding lots of food based on their poop? <laughs> anyway, fun random fact. And I see there's a fun fact about um, the pigmentation. Yes, so blue pigments are incredibly rare in the natural environment. And so how they're creating green pigments is actually a layer of something called xanthophils and then iridophores. So the xanthophils produce that yellow pigmentation. It's a type of carotenoid, kind of like what makes um, fruits and vegetables the different colors that we see. So anything that's yellow has those carotenoids in them. And the iridophores are a structure that reflects blue. So you combine the blue and the yellow, you get green. Um, but most blue that you see in the environment is not actually a blue pigment, it's just the structure. So butterfly wings, blue feathers, if you look at them under the microscope, they're not blue. They just look blue. It's very wild. Do you have a field guide I recommend for amateur herbers? So there's a few different ones that are helpful. Um, there's the salamanders of the southeast. That one is pretty solid. I personally favor the salamanders of North America and Canada, but it's a little bit outdated now. There have been new species described since then. Um, there's also one for herps of North Carolina and Virginia, and those are the ones that I know of. But the biggest thing is probably using Amphibia Web um, to search what you think it is and then find out if that actually exists in your area, because it really is all about geography. But those are good places to start. There's also a book specifically for the Smoky Mountains if you're going there. So that one's a really good pocket guide for that particular trip. So I've heard a lot about salamander migrations, and particularly, I think it's with the mole salamander this time of year. Do you know anything about that? Is that something that you would see around here, um, since they are sort of in this area? Yeah, so mole and spotted salamanders are migrating about this time of year. Um, on warm, rainy nights, you might see a bunch of them moving toward a wetland, especially if you're close to one. We don't get as massive of migrations down in the south as you do up in the northeast because our weather is more suitable. And so there's more nights that are like, yeah, okay, I can move tonight. And so you're less likely to get that like mass migration. But in um, September, October, you'll also get a migration of marble salamanders. So if you're out on wet nights during either of those times of year, you might see salamanders moving around if you're close to a wetland. <laughs> yep. Question. Those salamanders, like I think that's what we saw under mulch that we had in uh -huh. the house. Um, we were changing things around and we were digging, and we saw a couple of them. I don't know, that's in there. But there is no water around. So these guys will nest in areas pretty far away from their water. They will migrate like hundreds of meters to get to their water source. It's actually quite remarkable. One of the ways that we think that they find wetlands is they can actually see reflections of polarized light. And so water reflects polarized light and they can see that. And so they'll be like, oh yes, over there, that's water. And they'll go towards it. This is also one of the reasons that roads are a problem because sometimes they will reflect polarized light. So that gets confusing for them. What was that website? Amphibia. Amphibia Web. The, uh, the North Carolina, there's a North Carolina one too that's really helpful, just like North Carolina herps, I think. 
And as far as their natural predators, primarily birds? Birds, snakes, other salamanders. <laughs> because they'll eat anything they can fit in their mouth. <laughs> um, spring salamanders in particular are known to prey on other salamander species. I actually saw one wrestling one one time, and that was quite fun. <laughs> It's like doing like log rolls, trying to get it into its mouth. It's wild. Where are uh, tiger salamanders found? They're in the coastal plain. But they, they can be found in like North Carolina? Yes, they can. Not in really high abundances, but they can be found here. There's a different species over in California as well. They're really cool. And they get quite large. Yeah, huge. Yeah. I have other random salamander facts. Sure. Yes. <laughs> I have a lot of those. Did you say the migration is called a maelstrom? So a massive group of salamanders is called a maelstrom. So awesome. I know, right? It's so metal. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's really, really neat. Just yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Um, so the largest salamanders in the world are found in China and Japan, and they're called Chinese or Japanese giant salamanders. They recently found there's also more species in there, but they can be, typically they're only about three feet anymore, but they could be up to like five feet, so like the size of me, which is so cool. So that's really neat. I want to see one in person because that would be amazing. Um, so they live in really highly oxygenated streams. They look a lot like hellbenders. They're really closely related. So they have the flattened heads and they'll just kind of grip on the bottom of the stream and hang out there. So those are really cool. Um, there's another really neat system of salamanders in the north, northern part of the Midwest, so like in Michigan area, where there is something called polyploids. Um, so most species have two sets of chromosomes. These guys have anywhere from three to six sets of chromosomes, and they can be hybrids between three different species. They're actually unisexual, so they can reproduce through something called parthenogenesis. So they don't need a male to actually kickstart the reproduction, but they will do something called kleptogenesis, where they will steal sperm from other species to kickstart their system and then use it or not. So like, this is how you end up with the quadruploids and the quintuploids. Once they get to about six sets of chromosomes, they can't keep producing offspring, but whenever they're only triploid, they can. So that's super wild. They had to create a new term for it because they're like, what do I do with this? <laughs> um, so salamanders have external fertilization, external sperm transfer, with internal fertilization, meaning that most species will Basically, they lay down a packet of sperm on the ground and the female will pick it up with their cloaca. Then they internally fertilize their eggs and then they lay them. So like some frogs and fish will put their eggs out into the water and then the sperm will go onto the eggs and that's how they get fertilized. So these guys have internal fertilization. And so that's how they can steal sperm from other species. I wonder. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's wild. Um, yeah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no mating dance for those guys. Because, yeah, they're, they're unisexual. They reproduce asexually. Um, they're one of the longest living um, asexual vertebrate species because they can get genetic variation from these other species if they want to. It's wild. <laughs> they would normally lay like a dozen eggs? It varies from species to species. Um, for the, like it, it it's actually a lot more than that. So like the invisimals, the ones that I showed you the egg masses of, those can be up to about 150. Um, a lot of, some species will produce smaller clutches where it is only about a dozen. Green salamanders, it's probably only about a dozen. But some of the larger species can produce massive clutches of eggs. I don't even know how big they are for things like sirens. Like sirens can get to be like this big. So. They can produce a lot more eggs. It's definitely size dependent. Um, the bigger you are, the more eggs you can produce. How long does it take for eggs to It depends on the species. Some of them are very quick, um, just a few weeks, and some of them it takes a lot longer. It depends on temperature. So is that uh, also how 
Yeah, it can vary as well. Yep. Does temperature have anything to do with their gender or They yeah, they don't have um, temperature sex determination like a lot of turtles do. It seems to be genetic. There's still a lot we don't know. Um, because they spend so much of their lives living underground, we just we can't see that part as well. So we still don't understand a lot of it. We need to make like a giant ant bar so you can see them. I know them. that would be really fun. <laughs> right? And just have it like black light or something. That'd be awesome. awesome. I know. <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, maybe they would actually behave normally. Um, that's kind of another random thing. If you bring a lot of, especially the lungless salamanders, into the lab, they behave really weird. They just stop behaving normally. They climb all over everything, and they're just like, "No, <laughs> I'm not going to behave like I do outside. I know I'm not there." Very sassy. We have a question on the chat board. Most salamanders in the U.S. do not have a larval stage. They are direct developers. Yes, that is true. Um, in fact, most salamanders are direct developers. So there's some really cool species in the tropics that actually live in completely in the canopy. So they live in bromeliads and things like that because it's moist enough that they can actually survive there. So most of those are direct developers as well. Most of the species that don't have lungs don't have an aquatic larval stage. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing, though, too. There are a few of them that do, and it, like, evolutionarily, they lost the ability to have this larval stage, and then they regained it for some of them. So, yeah, it's really wild. Do they get some kind of benefit? That's a good question. Is there a benefit? So, there can be a benefit of you have more access to water. So there's different food availability um, when you live in the water for the larval stage. By having access to two different habitats, you're more likely to, potentially more likely to survive because you're sort of splitting your time between different places. And so you may not encounter the same predators. At the same time, it can be more difficult because now you have to deal with different types of predators like fish in the water or you don't have to deal with them on the land. So like there are different trade-offs to that. Um, as for the reason why it re-evolved, I don't really know. <laughs> um, I, I'm guessing it's because when, when they re-evolved, there probably wasn't anything else living in the water where, that was eating all of the macroinvertebrates and the things that were living in the water. And so that was sort of an untapped food source. So if you get back into the water, suddenly you can take advantage of that food source. They're mostly found in, especially the stream drilling ones, and that's mostly what re-evolved the ability to have this larval stage. They're mostly in streams that don't have fish because they're small enough and close enough to the headwater of the stream. They don't really have to worry about fish, so they are the top predator in that system. Um, and so one thing that's neat about the Desunathus, which are the ones that re-evolved it, is they have this really cool ecological pattern where the largest ones live mostly in the water, and the smallest species within this genus live mostly on land. And there's this like range of size between the two, and it relates directly to how much they live in the water. So the medium-sized ones spend some time in the water, and then the ones that are really tiny spend all their time on land. Um, and yeah, it's just really fascinating. On the, uh, on the newt, you're saying, it has a, a toxin on its skin. Yeah. And if you just, if you touch it, I mean, you have to be you have to in have contact a cut. for a while. You have to have a cut on your hand. Well, it can't get through our skin. This is why I tell you not to lick them. I'm good, good call. <laughs> What's even the call? <laughs> um, so there's a really fun story about the California newts, which also produce citrotoxins. Um, they have a really brightly colored belly and they will like show it off. But how supposedly the tale goes of how they figured out they were toxic is that some people went out camping and they scooped up some water from the stream to make their coffee in the morning. And then a few days later, they found them all dead. And they looked in the coffee pot and there was a salamander in the coffee pot, <laughs> produced enough toxin to kill everybody. They still had coffee in their cups too. So it doesn't take a lot. 
Um, and the reason they're so incredibly toxic is actually this relationship with a snake. So the garter snakes that live in California, some of them will eat newts. And so they actually have a resistance to the toxin. So if they're resistant, the salamanders had to get more toxic to battle the resistance. So then they get more resistance and they get more toxic. And it keeps going in this evolutionary arms race of who's going to win. And so you actually have areas that are more toxic than others, depending on if the snakes eat them in that area. And so it's like patchy distribution. It's really interesting. I'm going to look up the coffee thing. I'm a little skeptical. I mean, yeah, it could be it's a fun life. story. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Um, probably my favorite story about salamanders is actually the word salamander means fire being, which is kind of funny since, yeah, fire being. And so you would think that's a little weird because they always look wet. Um, but that one might be partly why. But the, again, the story goes that in the Middle Ages, people put rotting logs on their fire. And when they lit it, a salamander would run out. They'd be like, oh my God, it's created by the fire. Really, they were just like, you burned the house down, <laughs> trying to escape. <laughs> but, you know, fun story. Now that one I believe. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Totally fair. It was excellent. I mean, absolutely fabulous. Thank yeah. you so much. Anytime. I will gladly talk about salamanders anytime you want. <laughs> What do those three, three to five foot ones eat that are in Japan and China? They eat fish. They eat, like fish yeah. The hellbenders eat fish here too, as well. Yeah. I'm picturing the Moto Dragon. You know what I mean? Like something really monstrous. I mean, they're they're quite large. I mean, like their heads are like this wide. Um, but they're really flat. <laughs> have you ever been bitten by them? Um, I have been. Salamanders have tried to bite me before, but they don't really have teeth. So it's just kind of like, what, what you doing, friend? <laughs> you're also like the size of my finger. I don't know where you think you're going to get with that. Um, but amphiumas do have teeth, and they will bite to the bone. Do not get bit by an amphiuma if you can avoid it. Um, those guys also are like sirens. They live in really muddy waters, so you're not necessarily going to find them unless you're looking for them. But don't stick your finger in its mouth. That time. Yeah. Salamanders are neat. <laughs> They're super neat. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for.